what I'm talking about. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Chris. Thank you for joining my session. I hope that um, everything is working fine on the technical side, as there um, might be some barriers for you. Um, the YouTube live channel that you will find on the main page of um, the DTCAM. For this session, um, I will give a keynote input presentation, which will last about, let's say, 20 to 30 minutes, more 30 than 20. And um, I have um, reacted very uh, on a short term basis for a certain request that I had in, um, prior to this session, which is that many of you guys asked for um, a more extended intro into the topic of the circular economy, because not much of you or not many of you are familiar with the topic for a longer time. So without further ado, I would um, switch now to the presentation. And in case you would like to post any questions, um, I would highly recommend to use the Slido app, um, which there's a link in the, um, in the session description that you will find. But you can also see the same thing. Here on the presenter slide, um, there is a barcode that you can scan in order to take part in the session. So if you would like to pose a question that I should answer in the Q&A after the presentation, I will refer to that list. And in case you have a question that is um, very much interest uh, interesting to you, you can upvote those questions. So in the end of the presentation, I will answer the questions according to priority or according to upvotes, just as a hint to you. So let me start with the session. Um, I will give you an input or an introduction into circular value creation uh, and mainly on the building blocks and business models in the circular economy. So this is um, a keynote that I give many times, especially when I work with clients and if I want to um, put them into the topic space. Um, many of those companies that I work with are already familiar with the topic. Some of the team members of those companies or projects are not that familiar with circular economy, which is why um, this slide deck has a mixture of introductory slides, but also more going into the depth of the case studies. A few words uh, from my side. Um, my name is Chris. I'm one of the three partners of the innovation consultancy Codify, Codify Group in Berlin. Um, and in my past, I have been working on um, many circular economy related pro uh, projects on another brand or through another brand, which is called Next Cycle, which was mainly based in Cologne. And all the case studies that you will see, or all the references that I will use in this presentation, are or, uh, or originated in that time. So, in case you have any follow up questions, or let's say, more deeper or questions in depth on certain um, studies or certain cases that I will show you now, you can also contact me afterwards because there are many more tales to tell. So introduction to the topic. 
Something that I changed um, in terms of narrative for the circular economy more recently is that I always now start by introducing the topic through the term of the Anthropocene. The Anthropocene, um, I think most of you might be familiar with the term right, uh, already, is the time in history when um, humans really affected the environment on, the large, on a large scale and even uh, on, on such a large scale that it can be detected on a geological um, level. Meaning it so it's, uh, dates back to the first drop of the atomic bomb in 1945. This is um, now indicated as the start of the Anthropocene. And this was the time when man-made material really cultivated the environment and really um, cultivated the earth. So if you look at all the things that surround us today, it's important to see that most of the materials that we are interact with in, on a daily basis, they don't come from nature. They are all man-made. Um, we use certain materials like technology metals or aluminum alloys or other alloys. We use agrochemicals for food, um, but we also do other chemical and material um, injections from a technological point of view, meaning that the materials that surround us are not designed to be um, recycled or discarded by nature, um, as opposed to all the materials that we know from nature. If you look at environmental systems or natural systems, all those systems are designed in a way that all the materials that are put in the environment are or eventually in the end get recycled or upcycled by nature. And this is something that we can see um, doesn't count for human-made materials. So at least from the start of the Anthropocene, we were put into a position where humankind has to think about their responsibility when it comes to putting materials into the environment. Because the things that we want to avoid is that those materials end up in nature or end up in systems that cannot recycle or upcycle those materials. And when you look at all the long-term perspectives or long-term, um, um, all the, all the long-term projections for the environment, you will see that this material intake or um, the feedback loops that we create with those materials really damage not only the environment, but also social systems. Because you can see that people are now forced to recycle those waste that we have not designed to be recycled or recyclable. In a more broader term, let's start with the, uh, let's start with the definition. There's one definition of the circular economy which has become very handy to me as it's um, changed from month to month. Um, for the last two years, I've been using this definition because it really sums up the topic um, from my point of view in a very good way and it's not too long as for people to become boring. So the circular economy aims to be restorative by design. So they can always already see the, um, pr the predominant importance of design in the circular economy. And at the core, the object, uh, the objective is to move away from this take, make, waste linear system of putting materials from the earth, putting them into products, using them, and then disposing of them um, into a system that optimizes for the use of products. So for product service systems and business models for multiple cycles. Um, especially for the disassembly and reuse before conventional recycling. It may sound a little bit bulky in the end, but the thing that you need to know is that, um, re that the circular economy is often reduced to the term of recycling. So most of the designers that I've met throughout the years, they also connect this topic um, firsthand with recycling. The problem for me is 
then I don't see recycling as one of the more favorable options in the circular economy. It's more like the last resort. So conventional product design is um, for the last years in, in, in the green design movement has become design for recyclability. But this is only a first step. It's actually very easy from a technological perspective to recycle materials or recycle products, but it's more challenging to design for disassembly, reuse, repair, remanufacturing. Um, the end goal that we are trying to achieve in the circular economy here is to retain the value of those materials. And not only from an economic point of view, we want to retain the use value of those products and services and products. But more details later. There are four basic core principles and business models that I would like to introduce to you. The first core principle of the circular economy is uh, longevity by design. And this is done mainly through maintenance and upgrades or modularity. So we are aiming for optimized utilization of products and parts. We repair damaged and uh, we repair damaged goods and upgrade obsolete products, um, sale and reuse of products by others. Examples that you will find here is, for example, the iFixit repair manual platforms, which started as an open source platform in order to share repair manuals for Samsung and Apple mobile phones, um, and has now already pivoted into a more, even more profitable business model. Um, which is called Dozoki, which is a B2B repair platform where big manufacturers like Bosch or Daimler or um, even now Samsung and Apple um, can go to in order to set up repair manuals for their own goods on a B2B basis. The other, another case that falls into that principle is Fairphone, um, which started as a more socially sustainable products, so materials sourced from sustainable um, sources, at least to a major portion. But um, new, the newer versions of Fairphone also concentrate on the disassembly and modularity of the product. So it's easier to swap a certain camera, for example, if you are using a Fairphone of, sec of the second generation, you would be able to only switch the camera module. And um, this can be done with tools that you can easily access or that you can easily buy. So it makes it easier for the user to adopt the product and to upgrade it themselves. So in summary, the first principle that you can see here is more looking um, into ways how to prolong the life cycle of those products. And to give you one truth um, in the very early beginning, this is also the most profitable way in the circular economy. Those business cases that we can now see for the last 10 years in the circular businesses um, are the most, profit the most profitable ones integrate sharing, repairing, and reusing of their goods. Why is that? The, the main reason for this, this, um, this big profitability, profitability chance here in this field is that when you prolong the life cycle of your first product generation, so when it's first used, um, it retains the most value because as long as the product, as it is intended, is in use, the longer you can generate revenues with it because it's used in the way that it was intended by the designers or by the manufacturers. As soon as you put a product into a different context or switch product from, let's say, mobile phone, recycle it into something, um, something other, later on the plastics could be upcycled into parking, uh, into park benches, for example, then this is more of a downcycling of the whole thing and you are not using the product as it was intended to be. The next principle, core principle two, is product as a service. Um, this, is, this might be one of the principles that is 
familiar to most of you guys. Um, it's concerning the access over ownership issue. And one of the terms that you might come across here is the performance economy, which dates back or originated with Walter Stahel, um, one of the forefathers of the circular economy. The, but the thing that I would like to um, put an issue on here is that it's not only um, the, the issue of selling the services of a product instead of the product itself. So for example, with Philips Light Leasing, where you can only um, rent the light systems, you can install them or let them uh, install into your offices, for example, and then buy or then uh, sell, um, sorry, then um, pay a monthly allowance for using the systems. Um, or with Rolls-Royce, where you can have um, power by the hour and you don't have to buy the whole engine as an airplane uh, manufacturer, but you can also only use the turbines as long as you need them and maintenance and um, repair is done by Rolls-Royce themselves. Those kind of business models have become very um, widespread. It's the same as, for example, car sharing. But um, the, the thing that I want to put an issue on here is that we often neglect that this means something more, uh, more than just selling the, the service. It means that as, as soon as you as a producer put a product to the market, you also still have the um, reverse channel after the first use phase. So if you rent out this Philips light leasing system, for example, there will come a time when the user is no longer using this system. And then the whole issue of product system design starts, meaning how does this system, which was once installed at a user's place, how does it end up back at Philips? And what do you do with it? And in what frequency and what quantity do those light systems come back into your company? Or do you even implement another service provider in between who takes care of all that stuff? This is something that is often neglected when people look at those service-based business models. It's very, very different from the linear perspective. If you have a linear product, you put it onto the market, a user buys it, and then it's gone. And you're not you have and you have not any liability with it after um, after that point of sale but when you have this performance based business models it becomes a totally new game because you are still the owner of this product so you still have responsibility and liability also after the use phase so this puts very uh, many corporations to the challenge of how to deal with those reverse cycles. If you are not able to repair the product or to put it on the market as a service, the next thing that many companies do is they look at the remanufacturing and reuse of their products. This means that um, as, um, as opposed to recycling, that here we are talking about the reuse of products as a whole. So when you buy a refurbished or um, upgraded or remanufactured product, it's usually a product that was used for the first time and then gets refurbished by the original uh, equipment manufacturer or the producer. And one of the examples that you uh, might have seen here already is Caterpillar. So one of the biggest or the biggest industrial machine provider so for excavators, for example, or cranes, um, Caterpillar sells their used engines, or let's say they buy back their used engines in order to uh, remanufacture and upgrade them so that they can be sold afterwards for the second time. And um, because this has become one of the most profitable businesses for or business models for Caterpillar, they even created their own brand for it. Caterpillar Reman. And um, it may be interesting to you to hear that this also started as an experiment at um, Caterpillar, meaning 
that the first time that they introduced this kind of business model, they weren't sure whether this might be a profitable way to um, make business because they always had this, um, this send back program where users were allowed to send back their old machines to Caterpillar in order for them to recycle them or to dispose of them. And in, when they started their remanufacturing business, they first um, tried to only remanufacture the, the old machinery or the old um, products and sold them with a 40% discount um, on their platforms. But after a while, they saw that the performance of those remanufactured products were um, compatible with the primary goods or the new machinery, the ones that they sell for the first time. And this is when they had the epiphany, epiphany that, may, that it may be that used products are even compatible with new ones. And why should we then sell them with a 40% discount when the use value is still the same for the customer? So what they changed is they pivoted to another system. They offered their clients um, the possibility to send back their old, um, their old excavators or their old products and then said, okay, we will pay you 40% of the selling price when you give back your old product, depending on the um, outer appearance and depending on the status of that used good. And this motivated many of the clients to um, send back cleaned machinery or so they, they, sent back, uh, they sent back cleaned products on pallets, they even um, put their equipment and accessories to the package. So it immediately uh, increased the quality of the products that came back to Caterpillar. And after this, this made it very um, cost efficient to remanufacture then those goods and put them on the market again for the same selling price as, as they did um, with the new ones. And still, this is a profitable business, which is um, still in operation. So now there is the last resort of the circular economy, which is enabling recycling. So the closed loop recycling of material or for material recovery and retaining the resource um, values. Normally, this is the kind of business model or principle that I don't have to explain in detail, because this is what most of the companies already do. But when you look at it um, from the perspective of all the other principles that you've just saw, then you might come to the conclusion that the recycling model is the one which is the least favorable and also the least profitable option. Still, it's the one which is a favorite for all the companies because it's the easiest way to get rid of stuff. If you look at our linear economy, which produces many materials, many products, vast number of products, recycling might be the only strategy in order to cope with all those material streams. And it becomes very complex for companies to challenge themselves, um, change design, change business model in order to enter those other principles like remanufacturing, reuse or repair. Still, it's the easiest way to get rid of the things by scrapping them down, by burning them, generating energy, or recycling them, or, or recycle them um, with other service providers. Now, when you see those four principles um, as, as a whole, it's now easier for you to understand the topic of circular value creation. And in order to understand the circular value creation, you might have to look first on the linear system. Normally, the value creation and destruction in linear economics goes like this. We accumulate material, energy, and labor into a product, and then we sell it to the user, who normally starts with their so-called value destruction. So after point of sale, 
the value of products only decrease. Eventually they end up in landfill or incineration. When you now look at all the markets that are created right now in the circular scheme, we are talking about sharing, repairing, refurbishing, remanufacturing. All those markets are already billion dollar markets with lots of players, lots of products and services, lots of revenues generated. And when you now ask yourself, where do those markets take part or take place within this linear system, you might see that all those ones are only taking part or taking place in this, um, in this purple part of the diagram. So after the point of sale, when normally from a linear perspective, value destruction starts. So there's something off with this linear perspective. And how can you approach it differently? You can say that after the point of sale, there might be some kind of destruction of value, but only on the material side. When we look at circular economy, the markets for sharing, repairing, reusing, they only enable us to create more user value. And this is um, happening in two ways. It's either value preservation, so prolonging the life cycle of those products, so that the user can use the product as long as they want to, or as long as the product lasts. So when we repair or refurbish certain products, we allow or we um, create an opportunity for users to use their products longer. Actually very easy to understand. On the other hand, we also have the maximization of the user value. Um, this is normally done through the integration of other services or other, um, other products. For example, when you use a leasing scheme for driving your car, you normally integrate other products like a child seat, you buy winter tires, you maybe um, sign for an insurance for your car. All those are products and services that are that you as a user integrate into the product uh, car or the car as a product. And the more of those services that you integrate in the product, the more user, uh, the more user value you create eventually. And this is why I normally say that this left-hand side of the whole scheme is the material value creation, where you only accumulate material value up until the point of sale or the point of use nowadays. And then circular economy takes in or takes part in um, creating user value or maximizing user value. And I don't want to neglect that eventually those products can also end up on landfill or in, on, uh, for incineration. But um, the main goal or aim is to avoid this moment in time as long as um, desired by the user and as long as economically feasible. So as a summary, the circular economy domain is a set of principles or designs that is optimized for use. And if you look at the linear economy domain, there you normally optimize um, for selling the products. So as when, when you um, consider yourself a circular product designer, for example, you don't optimize for the point of sale, but you optimize for the use of the product itself. And this is something which totally changes the game when it comes to the circular economy. So for the last part of the presentation, let me introduce you um, three ways of innovation foci or innovation focuses that you can choose as a product designer or as a, a design thinker, which is that when you look at the circular system of products and services, you normally start with material input and you can end up 
on the end with the end of life as waste. And um, you will now you you see here in that flowchart that um, it has become a little bit more complex compared to the linear one because it not only integrates one user but it also integrates uh, user X, meaning every user that follows the first user of a product. Um, and this is this may be the only thing that you need to know in order to understand this flowchart. So products normally and there I will give you an example. Products normally start with, um, when we take the example of a car, with the OEM who produces the car. So the first value proposition is that um, a car manufacturer offers you um, mobility through the product of a car. You buy as a user, you, you use and buy this product um, as user one, and then you yourself, you create the value by using this product, by repairing it, upgrading it, integrating other things like accessories or the, um, cheat, uh, the child seat that I just mentioned. You also wash the car, you um, buy insurance, you pay parking tickets. All those are services or revenues that are, that are generated that are only generated because you are using a car. Eventually, this first use cycle is over, so you want to get rid of the car. Then the circular economy enablers come into play. And those enablers are not only the integrators of other products or values, but those are the ones that offer um, repair services, remanufacturing services, and all the services that prolong the life cycle of your product. Or the, um, the CE enablers are the ones that connect user one to user X. So a car dealer, for example, buys your old car and sells it to user X. And then the whole cycle starts again. When you look at this um, systemic flowchart, there are three distinct ways in order to approach it. You can start with circularity as a design constraint. So meaning when you are um, a product designer or service designer, you are aiming to only choose materials for your design that are easy to recycle or that are easy to maintain, easy to repair, easy to remanufacture. Modularity, with, as with the, um, with the Fairphone example, is only one approach. Biomimicry and cradle to cradle are other um, design philosophies here. But if you are optimized products for use, you should use circularity or the, um, let's say, the box of materials that you will use as a design constraint from the beginning on. If you want to go a little bit further, you have to um, take a second look on the value proposition of those products when it comes to circularity. It's very easy to understand that new products have another value proposition compared to used products. So this is something that you have to take focus on in those projects as well. If you have user one for a new product, for example here with Philips, for an MRI system, it's a totally other value proposition compared to the refurbished systems, which are used and here no normally now uh, used in university or um, scientific institution settings, that you really have to redesign the value proposition and you have to differentiate between user one and user X. And this is often neglected because many people think that as soon as you um, sell a used product, which creates the same value, the value proposition stays the same as well. The last one is the reverse logistics experience. This is the so-called dark side of the moon in the circular economy. Um, I already started to indicate the problem here. When you as a product manufacturer start to put products into the system, it's very hard to imagine how this forward stream of materials will look like when they end up at your company again. So just imagine a washing machine producer who sells a thousand um, new machines per day 
um, how such a reverse logistic cycle would look like. Um, it would normally mean that up to a thousand of used machines will end up back at the facilities. And for this, uh, um, for this um, instance, you have to set up a whole new set, not only of organizational parts, but also employees, competencies, um, space, and many more. This is why so many CE enablers now enter the space and offer services for reverse logistics. So taking over not only the logistics, but also the collection, separation, and upgrading or cleaning of those used products in order to take a little bit of the pressure from the original manufacturers. So now, as we have 10 to 15 minutes left, um, I would like to thank you for listening so far to this input. And I will now um, shift to the Q&A part of the session, which has hopefully worked. Let me switch to another screen. So ideally, you will see now some of the questions concerning the presentation, and I will now answer them according to upvotes or priority. So the first one is anon anonymous, um, and here someone asks, why aren't more companies doing this? Not able to care the right value proposition? Not enough altruism or weak government policy incentives? Okay, th that's a very big one, because it touches upon many issues. Mm. From my experience, those companies that put the, um, let's say, that put the circularity aspects or the sustainability aspect of their products in the background are those ones which are most successful. Um, meaning that if you really want to design a profitable business in that industry, you don't necessarily have to communicate that you are a circular economy company. Take for the example um, Caterpillar. When you use this product, or when you use this, when you when you put this product on the market for the first time, then um, sorry, I lost track. Um, <laughs> when you when you put products on the market, like in the case of um, Caterpillar, they didn't care about the environmental in impact of their business model. They only cared about the performance of the products. And they were trying to find a way to um, use their old products and give them back to their users. So what they had in mind was that they wanted to increase the use value or user value for their customers. And I think this is one of the main ingredients that you need as a business. You need to understand that circular products are most convincing when they create more value or um, the same value as new products. And this is something that you don't necessarily have to communicate. This is something that should be obvious. I normally buy, for example, refurbished um, technical goods like my MacBook or my, um, my Fairphone or iPhone or other technical stuff. Many of those refurbished or manufactured goods, they cannot be distinguished from new ones. And the, the reason why so few companies are doing it, um, maybe that it's very hard to change from this linear to the circular system. We are still looking for ways to um, have the, those, those big change stories. And there it's very, very hard for the companies to create those because they come along with lots of other um, feedback loops. The weak government policies, um, weak incentives, yes, that's not an issue, because nowadays it's very easy for companies to get rid of their waste. Normally, as a producer, you buy, um, you, you sell, a, so you pay a certain allowance for the recycling, so you have to take care of the parts of the things that you put on the market. This is called the extended, extended producer responsibility. But normally, this is something um, which only motivates companies to do more recycling. 
there are not that many um, incentives right now from a governmental point of view that really motivate companies to go into circular economy. It may be something, and there is a hint, um, there is a so-called X-Tax initiative. It's in France and the UK. It's already in place for some products where you have um, a lower VAT rate, value-added tax rate on secondary materials. Because why does it make sense? Um, or it doesn't make sense to sell, to pay the same uh, VAT tax on used products than you do on primary goods because it already has been paid. So next question, um, what processes and methodologies do you apply in creating value re re proposition, uh, repropositions? Sorry. Um, the thing that I use mostly is that I start with the value proposition canvas. Um, so the plugin that you might know from the business model canvas. I normally start by mapping out the current value proposition of um, primary goods, so the, the goods that the company is selling to the users right now. And then I try to find um, those areas where circular economy would reduce the risk for those value propositions. Um, it's a little bit too complex to now get into deep into depth here, but um, let me say that the main methodology that I use here is value proposition design. And then I compare this one with um, the user journey for um, circular products or circular users and try to compare the two value propositions from both journeys um, from the point, of, uh, the point of view from the user. We have uh, Florian with another question. The business model for such a new circular economy would need a strategic shift on management level. Do you have experience in influencing this transformation? Um, yes, I do. Um, the strategic shift on management level is something which um, comes across very frequently. The easiest to convince are those ones who are led by the owner. So SME companies or family companies, they are easier to convince uh, when it comes to the big strategic shift in terms of circular economy. But um, as soon as you are in contact with bigger companies or stock traded companies, it's very hard to convince them um, to, ch to shift from this linear uh, model to a circular one. And there normally it starts with either convincing smaller groups that work like pirates um, in, those camp in those companies and then um, really try to change this from the inside. But I have a big, um, let's say, um, my, my biggest learning in the recent years was to do that through just um, showing them the business case of the circular economy. And there is a distinct business case for the circular economy. As soon as you show companies with linear products that they really um, are not looking on the revenues that get generated after the point of sale, they normally start thinking about their products from a different perspective. So what are those values or what are those revenues that are generated with my product that is put to the market? Um, how many from from how many um, so how many revenues or how many users I cannot touch base with when I only sell the product? So this is more like a, a thought experiment for many of the companies that I work with in the beginning. When you ask them, just imagine for a second. Um, if you would live in a world where your product would no longer be allowed to, um, to sold, but where it can only be rented out, or where it can only be put on the market as a service. How would that affect your company? Another anonymous one is um, some companies like mobile handset manufacturers are even doing things that slow down software on old devices. Um, how we can even take this concept to software. Okay, um, 
I totally get what you mean, the, uh, the so-called term of plant um, obsolescence, meaning that many of the companies are not building their products um, for uh, longer use um, anymore. It's something of a two-sided uh, issue. Thing is, when you look at the companies that are doing this on, the pro on, on purpose, um, those are the ones that are hard to convince, surely. But if you look at those companies that are forced into this kind of design principle, it's um, often impossible for those companies to compete with the market when they are not reducing costs on the production side. And as soon as they produce costs on the production side, um, it's normally at the cost of quality. And the cost of quality then ends up in um, products that break fast. It's not always um, the intent of those manufacturers to do so, but in order to compete with the linear market, they often have to do that. So there is not one answer to approach this issue, but um, maybe we can, maybe I can go uh, come back to you um, after the talk, because there are some short ways to, to do that. We may have time for two last questions, because then afterwards I would like to give you the opportunity to change to other rooms. Um, just as a hint, if uh, I will let this Slido channel open after the session, so you can still post your questions there. Um, if you put your name to the questions, I will answer you also personally if you want. Um, if you put your question there anonymously, I will um, answer them on the Slido as well, and then also transfer those um, questions to the Fleep channel of this session. And also for all the materials, um, like the slide deck or book recommendations, or um, yeah, the slide deck, book recommendations, or other recommendations for methodologies and tools, I will also pin to the channel in Fleep. So if you're not done so, um, go back to the channel, to the session description of this session and then um, lock yourself into the channel for this talk because there we can also discuss after this session. Um, let me do just one final question. Is there one? Yeah, if you look at the question um, from Michelle, which industries do you, view, do you view to be most easily integrated in the circular economy? You can see that those industries that have um, entered the circular economy market recently and with most success or many success is the plastics industry, but just because they had the biggest pressure um, when you look at the big issue of um, plastics in the ocean, and it's a very obvious issue that this is something uh, dating back to the Anthropocene that becomes now a liability for those companies again. So they have a high pressure in order to act here. Another one which is more interesting, as I think right now, is the fashion industry. Um, so there are lots of initiatives for garments or circular garments um, that are in place right now, but basically it's the easiest to integrate for those um, industries where you have a very transparent view on the material streams. So the easier it is for companies to see where materials are going on a global basis and where they end up after use, the easier it is for them to start on their circular journey. Because many of the companies that I've worked with they don't know, um, I, don't, I, I won't say anything, but they know very few um, about their, what happens to their products after they sell them. Um, I've skipped one of the slides in the presentation where it says that um, one of the biggest washing machine producers in the world, they say that 30% 
of their products that they put in market, they don't know where they end up. And um, this is something very interesting because from a risk perspective, it's uh, nice to see that you put those markets, uh, those products on market, but you have no uh, liability or responsibility to go after those products. And this is something which is very interesting because it opens up a whole new um, area for the circular economy and for those companies. And then the last one, my favorite book on the circular economy, and this I will um, take as a chance to switch back to the camera so that you can see me again, is that um, I've placed it here because I was prepared to answer this question because it, because it came in before the session. Um, it's called the Circular Economy as a User as a User's Guide um, from Walter Starhill. Um, you can find it on all the prominent um, bookstores online and offline. Um, although it's not that thick, um, it's one of the books that has um, come to my attention in the last 12 months, let's say, and it really um, puts someone into the focus again, um, Walter Starhill, like I said, who was one of the forefathers of the circular economy and now ch shares his views from a user's point um, of view on the circular economy. So especially when you are in the design thinking area or the design product, product design area, um, I would highly recommend to um, consult that book or to read that book. Um, I will post the link to that book also in the show notes, so in the flip channel and uh, maybe to the Slido as well. That's about it from my side. Um, there are now, we are now eight minutes to four, so that will give you some time to switch to another session. Um, it was a very new situation for me to do that now live without uh, without seeing anyone uh, in the audience. So um, I hope I made sense with some of my sentences <laughs> that you heard, and I hope that you enjoyed the session. Um, if you have further questions, um, also want to get in touch with me, you will find also the um, details for my personal contacts and um, the channels that you can reach me on the session description. So for now, I would like to say thank you to all of you. Um, I will now get into the Slido channel again and also on Fleet to answer questions, but um, take care of yourself. I hope you enjoy the rest of the day. And if I can give one personal recommendation for another session, um, I'm sorry to say that I'm not sure when it's taking place, but the session of um, Arndt Pech Pechstein, um, on hybrid thinking, um, I would highly recommend because it would be a very nice add-on to this session on the circular economy as biomimicry is closely connected to that lens. So thank you very much for listening and this is Chris. Bye-bye.